Max Roach. Max, thanks so much for joining us. Well, I, I personally want to say it's a pleasure to be here with you, Ben, because you, your knowledge about the music and your interest in the music is really very inspiring to us as musicians. But to give you just a little something about Henry Street Blues, it was, uh, it's a piece from a play that I did from a very fine poet writer, Larry Neal. It was called The, the Monster and the Bell of the Horn, and it really, it was a story. It was produced down here at the Henry Street Theater. Uh -huh. That's hence, hence Henry Street Blues. And it was a story about uh, Philadelphia, and, it, and the character, the, the, uh, the leading character was a composite of Charlie Parker and Clifford Brown. The person was a saxophone player, but he, he, he was killed in an automobile accident, for example. Mm, as Clifford was. As Clifford was. So, so Henry Street Blues was part of the music for that particular play. Came from that particular play, yeah. One of the things that stood out to me when I first heard Henry Street Blues was the way the drums were used. The, the drums as a lead instrument, but also the drums as a comping instrument. Yeah. I got away from the ride cymbal, actually, on Henry Street Blues, and used the snare, which was... I guess you'd say a marching beat yeah. from that, but it was it was it, it comes out of the uh, traditional drumming, say, of uh, Baby Dodds and that crowd. Only we update it today, but it was just snare and bass drum mainly in hi hat and once in a while the cymbal. But it had that kind of feeling behind the 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 the, the whole piece. And as you know, Henry Street is a busy street down here on the east side in New York City. Uh -huh and uh, where a lot of shops and street vendors and all, it has that kind of feeling to it. And the theater's on that street, and they, do, of course, do uh, a great deal of contemporary theater, new writers and new artists, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one point in the track where uh, it breaks down to the bass and the drums and right. the interaction between the two instruments. In some way, it's very traditional. In some ways, it's... Um, no, it's contemporary. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's contemporary. But it comes out of traditional mode when drummers didn't deal as much with the with the ride cymbal and 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 they swung the band on the snare and the bass drum and once in a while the the ride cymbal yeah and it, I was thinking like that you know to get away from the ride and all the pieces which has become uh, almost rule of thumb today of course you've used a pianoless group for quite some time and when I refer back to a song like this it strikes me that the piano is also a percussion instrument yes and there's a kind of a comeback from the drums, the drums being not just a percussion instrument, but a melody percussion instrument as well. So not having a piano on a composition like this not only forces you, but allows you to count more and, and to play into it. Well, you know, jazz grew out of pianoless groups that came out of marching bands. Yeah. You know, New all the old New Orleans bands, there, there were no pianos on the streets. Piano really became popular in the music, I would imagine, during the ragtime period. Mm -hmm. And then it just took over just took over totally, doing Scott Joplin and all those great rag uh, creators. And, uh, and it became the instrument. And out of that, in, the instrumentalists, horns and things like, and drums had to take complete back seat when the rag time period uh, uh, flourished. But uh, the other groups, as you know, Ben, I, I, I do use piano. It's just the quartet I find. I like piano with this particular uh, instrumental format, say two horns, bass and drums, uh, because it it afforded me a lot of space, and there were two lean lines. I had, I had, uh, we all there. This it's like almost Japanese painting. The lines are lean yeah. and very transparent. See, and it's not it's not uh, doesn't have that chordal thickness that a piano gives to it. But I do use piano, of course, if I say did something with the chorus like I recorded with gospel choirs and choruses mm. and uh, things like that. You mentioned uh, Clifford Brown before, of course. Yes. It, it would be remiss not to remember the group that you led with Clifford Brown. And that seems to have been the last time you always used a piano player when you went out, which is right. in the late 50s. Right. Was, is there some reason that that was the group where you, at that point, tended to move on away from the piano, the piano player in that group? Uh, uh, being Richie Powell. Well, you know, when, when, when Clifford and Richie uh, were taken away from us in that, that awful uh, accident, that unfortunate uh, accident that happened, you know, the group travel, we accepted. We, we had been booked beyond that, of course. So I honored uh, some of those jobs as much as I could 
because it, it was it was a traumatic and emotional um, experience for me. I mean, I was really in Never Never Land for quite a while. So we, Sonny Rollins and George Maher and myself as a trio, honored some of the things that we had been committed without Brownie and uh, Richard. And I guess that might have been the beginning of what I began to hear out of that, out of that tragedy as we did, as we, as we worked these trio things, and it was almost like an in memorial to, the two, to these two very wonderful musicians. As we um, played a few, honored a few of the jobs that we had committed ourselves to without them, without Clifford yeah. and them, uh, Sonny and George and myself, we both began to adapt to just that sound and try to, f to compensate for the fact that the piano and the trumpet wasn't there. And I began to hear something else, and so did Sonny. And out of that, of course, Sonny did his first the Freedom Suite with Oscar Pettiford and myself. Speak for a moment, if you will, about the tuning of the drum and how you approach that. Well, the way I deal with the, with the set is I treat it as an instrument of indeterminate pitch. I usually tune to the size. The larger drums at the bottom, the next largest would be between that and the smaller drums. I don't tune, say, for fifths or fourths or thirds or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I recognize the fact that the instrument itself is of indeterminate pitch. I know that the best drummers know how to beat the instrument into the key that the music is being played in at that particular time. And one person especially who stands out is Art Blakey. Art Blakey gets on the stand with anybody's drum set if you're in F, G, B flat, E flat, the drums sound like they're in that key. So it's a way that your ear and your familiarity with the kit that you're working with and the cymbals and all that seem to serve. You just go right to it. You just go right to it. But of course, these are seasoned people who have been dealing with it quite some time. And also, the fact that many of the musicians who can do that, drummers who do that, are, are excellent musicians. Art Blakey was originally a pianist, as I was. You find Elvin Jones is a good guitar player, you find. And Tony Williams, and people like that, they write and perform, and they yeah. do things. They're composers as well. And so they almost hear inside it. But most drummers do it anyway. I hear drummers, and they write there. And the instrument allows it. You know, the, the drum set perhaps is the only, uh, I, I would say the drum set is the only instrument that came out of the United States of America's experience instrumentally that grew out of that. It's, mm. the, only, it's the only one that, that if, you, if you, when you look at percussion across the board, across the world, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, the Far East, South America, the drummers don't play with their feet. You see, the drummer, the United States of America, I say the USA drummer, because of course there's a whole South American and Mexican American uh, area of playing the instruments, percussion instruments. Well, we are like one man percussion ensembles. And, it's, and, it's, and that instrument is really homegrown USA, the, uh, the drum set itself. Trumpets and saxophones and violins and pianos and, and uh, a, Congos, all the other instruments come out of another part of the world, but mm -hmm. that, that instrument really is a USA instrument. It's probably the only original instrument that came out of the USA's experience, you know? The gathering of the various elements. Uh, yeah. Some came out of the parade, some came out of uh, the necessity to get a little backbeat going on a sax cymbal or whatever. Right, and right. The assemblage kind of evolved. And then, of course, the... the, the uh, the sociological, just the makeup of the people here. You know, we use symbols, which is, the, what is Middle Eastern. Yeah. We use uh, floor tom-toms and aerial tom-toms that come, that resemble, or were created to resemble tom-toms in Africa and also from the American Indian. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have snares and bass drums that come out of European experience yeah. and all this kind of stuff, you know. So, so when you put it all together, and then, we, and then we're dealing, so okay, now that wasn't enough, all right, because when you look at a, a symphony orchestra, you see maybe four or five people in a percussion ensemble who serve to, to play the lower parts of the instrument and all the other things, triangles and cymbals and yeah. these things. You look at the African percussion ensembles, they have uh, the uh, daddy, mama, 
and and uh, quinto, smaller drums, and you have four or five players and wonderful drum ensembles there as well. But here, the drummer is one man band, so to speak. Your mentioning of uh, the drummer using his feet brings to mind the influence of of dancing on jazz right. drumming, mm -hmm. and I. <laughs> heard from various sources that there's a, a cross-pollination that went on at one particular time that led to some of the stylistic elements of bebop drumming from uh, jazz dancing. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, the earlier drummers, like Papa Joe Jones, Buddy Rich, these guys were tap dancers. They are tap, and good tap dancers. Philly Joe's a good tap dancer. I do a little rattle and roll. You, you almost, you had to, you had to deal with the but, and it was good for your feet and dealing with all the other things. But then J.C. heard these people were dancers and then drummers, huh. or dancers as well as drummers, and great dancers. They, could, they danced on theater, on the circuit, you know, and the, and the uh, variety shows that we had. You know, like uh, we, the, the, the four-stroke roughs, you know, dilly that, dilly that, dilly that, all those kind of things, they are things that tap dancers use. Uh, Pa the, the sound of the paradiddle, the double paradiddle, and the triple paradiddle, which sounds just as it sounds like uh, paradiddle, paradiddle, ba ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da. Well, that also the feet do that. That do the that do the that do the double paradiddle, that do that do the that do that do the that do that do the triple paradiddle, that do that do that do the that do that do that do that do the that do the that do the that do the and cramps were. Well, like uh, roughs, you know, dilium, 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 dilium. When they would say dilyat, 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 dilyat. And of course, uh, when I was growing up during the 40s, there was a lot of theater, and this was all over the country, of course, and, and, and uh, they had variety shows. So you, you not only played with the band, but you also played with dancers, and you uh, played with singers, and you had to play for the chorus girls and all, this, all these things. So dancing, tap dancing, was a headliner, especially when Bill Bojangles Robinson was alive. Well, tap dancers would sometimes hit a show. If, if, if Bill Robinson was on a show with Duke Ellington, he'd get top billing. So the dancer, so dance was big. It was mm -hmm. like a pop singer. And uh, so dancers were always on the streets. You could go on the street corner and you'd find dancers of all persuasions, just rattling and rattling and rattling, Groundhog, Baby Lawrence. The drummers and dancers would do duets. We'd play duets together where they would do some unbelievable things and, and uh, we would try to imitate or catch them or they would try to catch or imitate some of the things that we were doing. So, It's a wonderful example of how the rhythm is kind of a universal feeling and it's carried in different parts of the body. I mean, it might come up from the feet and be carried in the hands on the Absolutely, drums and yeah. go back to the feet, yeah. but the rhythm is there, the rhythm exists. It always exists. So what we started doing was, all right, then you have the snare. If you had, say, a four-stroke gruff which sounded like on the snare, like da 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 tap dancer would see pop da pop pop da pop pop da pop Now we had all four limbs, so we had the bass drum, yeah. And uh, snare drum and, and, and side drums called tom toms. So we say boobaloom, boobaloom. So now we, so we had all kinds of ways of doing it. And the dancers would kind of cock their ear at us. But most of these folks are just uh, wonderful. When you listen to, say, a solo by people like uh, Papa Joe Jones or Buddy Rich, for example, you hear a lot of dance steps because they are dancers, good dancers, that is. And we should point out that the, the tradition is very much alive today. A modern drummer, Steve Gadd, started right. out as a tap dancer. Yeah, so there you go. And it's there still alive. Still, still alive, yeah. The discussion of the orchestral use of the drums leads me to a composition written and arranged by trumpet player Cecil Bridgewater. Interesting from a lot of points of view, but certainly the way the drums and the string quartet interact, I think, is mm -hmm. uh, revolutionary in some ways. The song Bird Says from the album Max Roach, Double Quartet. You don't often hear strings phrased with that kind of an attack. Well, the, I, 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 for me, you know, <clears throat> it had always been um, a desire of mine to do something with drums and strings, the trap set and strings, that is. On Bird Says, what we would do, what we did was a tribute to Charlie Parker, of course. And to get the strings, which to my knowledge had not been done before, to get them to play those uh, intricate and unique phrases of Charlie Parker's. And the song is based, of course, on a Charlie Parker uh, harmonic theme, confirmation itself. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, what Cecil did was to take quotes from Byrd and deal with it with the string ensemble. Now, strings had never, excepting, I guess, the earlier string players, Stuff Smith and, and Eddie South, they approached jazz playing more like the horns of the day they did. But the string players, mostly, they, it's always been kind of a legato instrument. It was either legato or staccato putting together. But jazz is unique in that nothing is ever that, is never on it that much. Things are always legato and staccato. Like, you know, that's a funny feeling altogether. So it's not like saying ta 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 or da ha 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 ha. It's 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 a, all of this combined is using the same thing. You know, it's like blues is both major and minor. It's never it's never that it's never this or that. It's usually a combination of of everything together to create some kind of feeling. It was a breakthrough to hear a string quartet phrase like that, and I knew it could, even though uh, the string players organized by my daughter, Maxine the Violist, mm-hmm. the, vi- the violist in the quartet. I knew that these kids who grew up, even though they studied at places like Ol- uh, Oberlin and Julian, and they were well-versed with the classics, they could do it because every day in their lives they've heard the Charlie Parkers and the Louis Armstrongs, and they hear all the contemporary music as well, these young people do. So it was a matter of them singing the phrases. Yeah. We would have them sing a Charlie Parker lick, and then figure out the way it should be fingered on the instrument. Because there's nowhere in the the string literature where they have ba 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 do ba do ba da do 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 informing the oral tradition. It's right. not just vocalized tone, but it's a vocalized tone that comes from a rhythmic attitude being translated all the way to the bastion of the classical Western tradition and get right, these string right. players to play with some jazz feeling. Historically, I look back on your work, and you're very much a group person, somebody who gets a family relationship going with musicians and uses that relationship. It's not unlike the great duets that Elvin and, and John Coltrane were to play. Thank you. And I was struck by, that's really possible after years of playing together, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. I've heard that same, well, uh, that attitude when you you talked about Elvin and John. I've heard that, and I've heard that with Charlie Parker and Dizzy. And I've heard it also with uh, Sidney Bechet and Louis, Louis Armstrong and Sidney Bechet, and and, uh, Baby Dodds and that group. But it does come from working together. But the groups, you know, the wonderful thing about... um, the music is that it's based on the personalities in the group. For example, when Clifford Brown and Richard were killed in that that awful uh, uh, automobile accident, then we had to find, I said, well, now people who knew about this group, they knew that, uh, okay, if if, if we hire, if we book Max Roach, we expect him to play some of the things that he did with, with uh, Clifford and so forth. Well, it was impossible to do because there was only one Clifford, see? So therefore, you had to find a trumpet player and find a repertoire that was not that for me. It, was, it took me a while before I went back to that repertoire for many reasons, of course. You know, uh, in the recording industry, you only survive if you come up with new product. You can't do what you did before anyway. You know, they'll tell you in a minute, well, you know, if they come back and tell I say, well, what do you want to do, Max? Well, I want to record Daoud and mm. Joy Spring and all the wonderful things we did with Brownie. They say, well, you've already recorded that. You have to come up with something new. Now, how you can, some, one of the ways of doing that, of course, is to change your personnel and to try to find people who do not sound as the people who were with you mm. prior to that period, see? In the case of Brownie, say you will never find another Brownie or Richard Powell as well. So what we so what I looked for was say people like a Kenny Durham. It's different. You've led me wonderfully to the album Max Roach Standard Time on the MRC Jazz Series label. It was recorded October twelfth, nineteen fifty six. The name of the song is Mr. X. It features Kenny Durham on trumpet, Sonny Rollins tenor. Actually, Mr. X was dedicated to Malcolm 
He was very young at that time and just he about to get on the scene. Yeah, yeah, just about coming out on the scene. Very few people knew, but we knew him and we knew how dynamic he was, you know, yeah. and how much of a wonderful human being he was. And he saw at that young age all the things that we saw that was happening to people, to black folks around the United States of America, the racism that had been existing for years. And so we would hear him talk, so the piece was really dedicated to, to young Malcolm, Mr. X. Let's speak for a moment in, in terms of the economic exploitation, not just of black musicians, but of all musicians yes. in the process of reissued records. There, there's some element of that that people don't talk about. There's a wonderful aspect that it makes great music available for right. a long period of time. And I particularly like the fact that a record that meant a lot 20 or 30 years ago means even more today. Not yeah. just as much, but even more. I understand. But there's a dark side of it, isn't there? There is, yeah. But first, thing, you know, musicians, and this is unfortunate, any musicians who deals in the world of jazz is always, it's always tough, it's rough. It's rough gen just for music, for the artists in, generally. But when we deal with, mu with music, say, Jazz has to fight to get on the radio, on the airways. If it weren't for people like you, we'd be, we'd be dead city for us. But the pops, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like fast food, you know. Get these young artists, put them on, make a hit record, get the next one, get the next one. You know, it's like that. Put the music. Whereas jazz is something that, as you said, could, 20 years from now you can reissue. Now that's good. Educationally, it gives, it gives a, a, a new audience to what we were, have been about and what, Things and, and what things are about, but the people who suffer are the side men on these dates. You know, the, the leader doesn't get a new fee, but if he's a composer, of course, he makes it. Yes. He, the leader gets artist royalties. Yes. But the men who help make that record, and as I said earlier, jazz is a democratic form, and everybody, you know, usually when, when we are mm -hmm. booked on concerts in Europe and every place else, they want to know who your personnel is. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, I've got... Uh, I've got Jerry Mulligan, but who's playing with him? Mm -hmm. I've got Max Roach, but who's in the band? I have Dizzy, who's in the band? My, who's with Miles now? Or this and that and the other. This is the way they, they buy according to who the drummer and everybody else is in the band. Because this is the way the music is. And music well, is totally different with a different band. It is right, different music. Right, see, so that's what it is. So then when you listen to these great records, say the records that we made with Charlie Parker that are being reissued, you know, we got paid minimally then in those days. You yes. know, we, it, was, it was a period when when there was a record band on. You know, that early stuff that we did with Charlie Parker, if it hadn't been for the, for the bodaciousness, I guess you might say, of uh, the producers at that time, and we as musicians, we'd have never made those records because we, we had to clandestinely sneak into studios and out of studios after hours because the union was checking on all the recording studios. Mm -hmm. At that time, the, union was, the, the, the musicians' union was afraid that the recording industry was going to hurt live music. Mm -hmm. and it was patronized live music in the 40s. And across the world, in England, Canada, all over the world, the International Musicians Union put a ban on recording. And so we recorded anyway during that period because that was one way that we could uh, augment our income, you see. And now we, li we listen to these records and they become classics. The union doesn't say anything because, of course, you do still pay what they call union dues for each one of these sessions. Mm -hmm. But the tragedy of it today is the record companies, the costs are minimal. They don't have studio costs, they don't have musicians costs, they don't have arranging costs, they don't have art costs for the cover, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so they come right from the very beginning, from the top they're making, a comp it's all gravy. So my thing is, I think that the sidemen should be paid. And a lot of the stuff that's coming out now today, of course, I was a sideman with mm -hmm. Charlie Parker and, and with Coleman Hawkins and those wonderful people that I had a chance to work with. We should point out also, a lot of these records were made before the time when musicians got royalties as such. So that's that true too, yeah. musicians uh, at various times had uh, received a couple of hundred dollars for the session. That was the end of it, by contract. There was nothing that led further down the road to anything. Yeah, well, if you were a writer, sometimes you sold your rights. This and you might sell Charlie a composition Parker. as well. That's yeah, right. Yeah, well, in case of Charlie Parker sold a lot of his, his material to different record, to different publishing houses, Bud Powell, even Duke, a lot of people got caught in that. You mentioned the importance of the members of the group in terms of what people get when they get something. One of the most 
interesting groups that's been on the scene, I guess, for over a decade now, is your percussion ensemble, Um Boom, Max Roach, Concert Snare, Warren Smith, Vibraphone, Eli Fountain, Bass Drum, Fred King, Timpani, Ray Mantia, Kungas, Joe Chambers, Bass Marimba, Freddie Waits, Shaker, what a group, Roy Brooks, Musical Saw, I love it, <laughs> Kenyatta Abdur Rahman, Multiple Percussion. You know, we formed Um Boom was kind of like a... Uh, it grew out of the fact that drummers were always... We were the second line. The front line was the front line. So yeah. here, with all these great drummers, they all were, you know, all of, all these guys can write. Roy Brooks is a fine composer. Joe Chambers is a great orchestrator, composer. Warren Smith, Fred King. A lot of piano players. Freddie Waits, piano players. <laughs> you know, wonderful. So we decided to get together and form. We said, you know, the percussion, percussion, the, the total percussion family from, from bells down to uh, bass marimbas and timpani, they, 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 they have the entire musical spectrum there, melodically, harmonically, and everything. So we decided to just, and this is old hat, of course, mm -hmm. when you deal with it, because there have been percussion ensembles from the beginning of time, I would imagine. But we decided to form one that, would, that we felt would best express the feeling we have in America, USA, that is, and and design it in with with what we what we all are about jazz bird and and Duke Ellington as an ensemble that had that had written aspects involved with it a lot of improvisational aspects and just the input democratic input from everybody so I'll I'll bring in a theme like like uh, street dance mm -hmm. and I'll say okay um, Brooks you saw on this and uh, Kenyatta. You play traps and waits, you this and that. And everybody says, okay, and everybody hears the flavor of the piece and goes right into it. You know, you direct just the flavor. Each piece is like that. So some of it's written, and a large part of it is just, okay, you know what the character of the piece is. It's a street dance and it's a march, <laughs> so get into it like that. But we really formed it as an answer to, so now we had all these wonderful percussionists whom people know as drummers, as street, as, as jazz drummers, but they know they all also play mallet instruments and timpani mm -hmm. and all these other wonderful instruments that belong to the percussion family. You mentioned the sound of the record, of the Um Boom record. Leads me to a, a discussion of contemporary drums, which include Lind drums and electronic drums. And these are drums that are plugged from a microchip into a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And yet it's the reality today, and it's the other end of the spectrum from something like this, but we are all dealing with it. And I, I read somewhere that you are dealing with Lindrums as well. Yes, I've had a chance to, re to uh, do something with the, with the Lin, and, and it was in a rap, experimental rap thing in a theater here in New York. And the Lin drum is part of the new arsenal of electronic technology yes. that initially threatened a lot of jazz players. Right. But more and more, I think, players are seeing it as a tool that you can use. You, it frees you. I think it, it helps to free you to do other things. Mm -hmm. It'll put the pulse down for you. The pulse won't breathe, however. It won't breathe, no. But you, you can, you can use it for effects, and it can work. You know, because then you breathe. You know, mm -hmm. it's like okay, having a rhythm section. Because I found it's a funny thing. I found that many times the drummer was just required to keep time. Mm -hmm. You know, bang. So now they developed it to the extent where you can almost make it um, the drummer sound just a wee bit ahead, ahead of the beat, like. Philly yes. Joe. Yes. Or you could make it lag like a Buhena. Or you could, you know, like our Blakey. Or you could, sure. you know, you could almost program these sounds in it where it does sound elastic. It won't breathe, but it can sound, it can wave. It almost sounds. So you use it like that. And of course, they're using it in the studios. And the threat to, of course, percussion players is they have to learn how to deal with that instrument. One of my favorite stories from Ralph Ellison is about a trip he once took to Africa many years ago and he describes a situation where there's a gasoline engine running and it's backfiring and popping and uh, the, the tribe in the village was dancing to the gasoline engine. I bet. Backfiring. I bet, yeah. Machinery can be musical. Yeah, I know Bob, um, when I was traveling back and forth from Brooklyn to Manhattan School of Music and riding the subways a lot of ideas come out of the way those the rattles of those wheels and those trains. I mean, it's unbelievable the rhythms that the train, the subway creates. When you when you're interested in percussion, you know, I'd sit down and close my eyes and just swoon, <laughs> so to speak. You know, today the music that you're playing has achieved a timeless quality. It's covering the history, and yet it doesn't require all the orchestration of the past mm -hmm. to be effective. 
A drummer has to be able to play, say, the way I grew up in New York City. From bar mitzvahs to marching bands to, to traditional New Orleans, Dixieland. This is where, you know, you have to be prepared to deal any kind, with any kind of situation. Play timpani in the, in, in the local symphony orchestra at, uh, at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, just everything. So you're prepared. You know, you're not just confined to do this or, the, or played. I played with Louis Jordan, and that was a shuffle king at that time. And I mean, mm -hmm. you'd have to tell your left hand. And I'd play, come back the next night and play with Bird and Diz. So when you say the variety of things that happen, you know, if you, if you come out of the rhythm section, you are exposed to all kinds of things, whereas you may not be if you say, I'm a, a soloist and a specialist. You may not be privy to all the other little things that would um, give you the kind of scope that say, oh, okay, so I'll have an unboom percussion ensemble. I'll try something with string quartet. It's kind of the good news for drummers out there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it it's is. It's a wide it open is. world. It is. It is. It's really uncharted territory, so to speak.